Hey y'all. In 2007 and 2008, a serial killer stalked the national forests of southern Appalachia, carefully choosing prey he could overpower as they ventured to the great outdoors for a hike. This episode isn't about cryptids or ghosts. This one is about the most frightening monster that you can encounter. Man. Friends, I want y'all to know this episode does have discussions of murder and sexual assault. So please keep that in mind. I'm Candace, and I'll be your guide. Gary Michael Hilton, born November 1946 in Atlanta, Georgia, reportedly had a turbulent childhood. He'd been mentally and physically abused by a stepfather, Nilo DeBag, as well as suffering grievous injury when a steel Murphy bed fell onto his head as a child. If you're unfamiliar, a Murphy bed is the type of bed that folds up into the wall when it's not in use and can be pulled down flat when it's needed. This injury partially scalped Hilton, who needed 200 stitches and time spent in the hospital to recover. It's generally unclear whether that head injury would have any bearing on his behaviors later in life, though. Later on, in 1959, at the age of 13, Gary decided to get revenge on his stepfather, who he deemed as having taken his mother away from him. Hilton held his stepfather, Nilo DeBag, at gunpoint before shooting him in the stomach when his stepdad taunted him about it. Fortunately, DeBag was not seriously wounded, but unfortunately, he had sympathy for Gary Hilton and declined to press charges. Gary had to go into a psychiatric facility for a few years after his first attempted murder of another person failed. According to reports, this is approximately the same time frame that Hilton's former girlfriend states that he told her he had been a victim of incestuous sexual abuse from his own mother. At 17 years old, Gary enlisted in the army where he was placed in the Davy Crockett platoon in West Germany, which was solely responsible for transporting and deploying the Davy Crockett missile, the lightest nuclear weapon developed at that time intended for use against the Soviets. It was essentially a suicide mission, as it was a given that the soldiers would not have enough time to clear the area at the time of detonation of the nuclear weapon. All of this stress caused considerable psychiatric harm to Gary Hilton, who, after a few years, began hearing voices, then soon after suffered a full schizophrenic breakdown. The soldiers had all been pre-screened for psychiatric disorders upon enlistment, but it seems like the army wasn't too concerned about his attempt to kill his stepfather or the following psychiatric hospitalization that he had. After his breakdown, Hilton was placed in a mental hospital and kept sedated on Thorazine. Rather than giving him a psychiatric discharge, the Army did him the favor of giving him an honorable discharge in 1967 at the age of 21. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Hilton drifted throughout the southern states. He had three short-lived marriages, with each one failing very quickly the longest being two years, and no children. Interestingly, in 1995, he worked with his criminal defense attorney, Samuel Rail, as a consultant on a thriller movie called Deadly Run. Hilton proposed the idea that the main character of the movie release women into the woods to be hunted like prey. He also was actively involved in the casting, as well as the selection of a cabin where the filming took place, near Cleveland, Georgia. He didn't hold down steady employment during this time, instead picking up odd jobs. One such job was Insulated Wall Systems, where he applied to a job posting in 1997, and was hired by John Tabor, who ran a home siding business from Duluth, Georgia. John knew Hilton to be an odd fellow, but gave him what work he could and even allowed Gary to stay on a property that John owned. However, shortly after moving in, Hilton began taking Ritalin. For a patient with ADD, Ritalin can increase focus, but apparently for him it caused problems with rage, 
and he began threatening Tabor and becoming increasingly confrontational. When Gary called Tabor and attempted to extort $10,000 from him under threat of death, John Tabor had finally had enough and kicked him off his property. Tabor states Hilton moved his things out over the course of the next few days. Despite the helping hand, Gary still had numerous criminal charges pressed against him during this time. A variety of offenses ranged from arson, drug possession, carrying a gun without a license, DUI, and 21 counts of solicitation, none of which bought him considerable jail time. He continued his nomadic ways, wandering in his Astro van with his dog, Dandy, over the mid-2000s, popping Ritalin as he went. Gary often mentions that he found solace in nature, spending much of his time in campgrounds and national forests, removed from the pressures of societal expectations. In 2007, he headed north to North Carolina's Pisgah National Forest near Asheville. On October 20, 2007, Gary came across John and Irene Bryant, a sweet and well-educated couple in their 80s who'd been married 58 years. Later, he admitted to camping out in the parking area, specifically to scout for victims. When he spotted the Bryants, he didn't believe he could control two victims at once. So he attacked Irene, killing her by using blunt force trauma to her head. He had John witness this to give him an additional element of intimidation and control. From there, he abducted John. All of this happened within 25 yards of their parking spot at Yellow Gap. A few days after the couple's disappearance, $300 was withdrawn from their bank account through an ATM in nearby Ducktown, Tennessee. Security footage only shows a shadowy figure in a raincoat. But a delivery driver in the area reported seeing someone matching Hilton's description. Irene's body was found three weeks later, covered by twigs and leaves, with multiple skull fractures. Three months later, a hunter in nearby Nantahala National Forest found a body, which was determined to be John's. He was found to have been killed by a gunshot wound to the head. After the murders, Gary Hilton headed back south to Cherokee County, Georgia, and camped out at a private hunting preserve. A local resident noticed him and filed a complaint with the Cherokee County PD, who sent a deputy out to shoo him from the area. Upon arrival, the deputy ran Hilton's ID through the state database and found no pending warrants so he sent him on his way. At the time, there was no requirement to check the federal database, so that wasn't done. If it had been done, however, the deputy would have seen that Hilton had an outstanding warrant for an unanswered citation for leaving an abandoned van on public property. If this warrant had been discovered, Gary Hilton would have been arrested, and quite possibly his next two victims would still be alive. After having been kicked out of the hunting preserve, Gary headed south to Florida, arriving in the Apalachicola National Forest near Tallahassee in November 2008. He had a brief encounter with a Park Services offer November 17th, who let him go with a warning not to exceed the 14-day limit for camping in the forest. Again, the officer did not run the federal check for warrants on Hilton. On December 1st, Gary Hilton encountered his next victim, 46-year-old nurse Cheryl Dunlap. Cheryl had mentioned to friends she was heading to the Leon Sinks Geographical Area of Apalachicola National Forest to do some reading. It is believed that Gary Hilton kidnapped Cheryl from this area and held her captive to withdraw her money from ATMs wearing a rubber mask in the process. Investigators believe after killing Cheryl, he 
burned her head and hands in his campfire before staging her car with a flat tire along the roadway. On December 15th, Apalachicola Park Ranger spot buzzards feasting on a large carcass. There, they found the body of Cheryl Dunlap. Well, most of it. As I mentioned, Gary Hilton had removed her head and hands to try to inhibit identification of her body, specifically. After discovery of her body, a hunter in the area ran across Gary Hilton in the woods, carrying a knife and appearing disheveled and homeless. The hunter warned Hilton that the woods are no place for a person to hang out during hunting season. This brief encounter was enough for the hunter to later aid the investigation by picking Gary out of a lineup. Multiple forestry agents also coincidentally ran his tag at this point, and as usual, they didn't find any state violations. While park rangers began their investigation into the murder of Cheryl Dunlap, Hilton was back on the road to North Georgia. On New Year's Day, 2008, 24-year-old recent UGA graduate Meredith Emerson went for a spontaneous hike at Blood Mountain in Vogel State Park in North Georgia. She parked her car at the Byron Herbert Reese Trailhead parking lot, taking the approach trail to the Appalachian Trail. She was accompanied by her loyal dog, Ella, and together they set off for the summit of Blood Mountain. Along the trail, she encountered Hilton, and they shared some general chit-chat as they hiked. But at 61 years old, he couldn't keep up the same way Meredith could. Unbeknownst to her, he and his dog, Dandy, chose to lay in wait on the approach trail. As Meredith and Ella came back down the mountain, Gary Hilton stepped out from behind some trees, armed with a police-style baton and a military knife. What Gary wasn't expecting, however, is that Meredith Emerson had a blue belt in Aikido, a Japanese martial art. She fought hard, knocking away the baton and countering his attack. He finally realized he had to, quote-unquote, control and silence her. His words. So using his military combat skills, he broke her nose and blackened both eyes. Before explaining to her that he only wanted her debit card and pin. Then, the two and both dogs avoided the known trails and made their way back down the mountain to Hilton's Astro Van. There, he bolted Meredith to the base of the passenger seat, where she couldn't be seen from the outside, and abducted her. Gary later admitted that Meredith forced him to return to the trailhead a few minutes later to pick up her beloved dog, Ella, who had been left behind. For three days... Gary Hilton drove Meredith Emerson around to various ATMs where he attempted to use the pin she gave him. Each one she gave, however, was incorrect. She was trying to buy time for investigators to find her. To punish her for giving him the incorrect numbers, he raped her. Repeatedly. He says because she owed it to him. When Meredith didn't return home on January 2nd, her roommate reported her missing and the search began. Thankfully, other hikers saw her talking to Hilton on that fateful New Year's Day hike. And Hilton was known to be a drifter with a frightening temper. The police announced to the public that Gary Hilton was now a person of interest in Meredith Emerson's disappearance. During their search of the Blood Mountain area, they found a police baton, water bottle, and a dog leash just off the trail. On January 3rd, Ella, Meredith's dog, wandered into a Kroger store in Cumming, Georgia, about 60 miles away from Blood Mountain. 
Gary later admitted he didn't have the heart to kill Ella. Some belongings of Meredith's were also found in a quick trip dumpster in Cumming. Her bloodied clothing, wallet with ID inside, and a bloody seatbelt were all found. Also found was a single boot that was later identified to belong to Cheryl Dunlap, the murdered nurse from Florida. News of Meredith's abduction went national, and soon John Tabor, Gary Hilton's former employer, received word. Around this time, Gary had called him in yet another attempt to extort money. After considering this for about an hour, Tabor called the local police to report the encounter. Police traced the call to a pancake house near Blood Mountain, but by that point, Hilton was gone. Shortly thereafter, he was spotted in a parking lot in DeKalb County, taking items from his van and tossing them into a dumpster. A call was made to 911, where the caller reported, quote, The guy you're looking for is cleaning out his van, unquote. This time, police made it on time, and Hilton had no chance for escape. Police managed to arrest him before he had the chance to bleach the interior of his van. Upon interrogation, he began rattling off a confession, explaining that he wanted to make a deal. Ultimately, the prosecution did agree that the death penalty would be off the table if Gary would show them where he hid Meredith's body. Under heavy guard, they set off to nearby Dawson Forest about 35 miles from Blood Mountain, where he buried Emerson. Hilton warns them, ominously, quote, the head will be missing, unquote. Just like with Cheryl Dunlap, he had removed her head. He explained that he buried it nearby. Like his other victims, she'd been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. When recounting the murder, Gary states, quote, It was hard. You gotta remember we'd spent several good days together. Unquote. As the GBI was connecting the dots in Meredith Emerson's murder, Florida began doing the same upon realizing that she and Cheryl Dunlap clearly had the same killer. On January 31st, 2008, Gary Hilton pled guilty to the abduction, rape, and murder of Meredith Emerson. Due to the plea deal where he led police to the location of her body, he received a sentence of life in prison. He will potentially be eligible for parole when he is 91 years old. After his sentencing in Georgia, Florida was ready to send him to trial for the murder of Cheryl Dunlap. Hilton was extradited to Tallahassee in February 2011, where he also pleaded guilty to that murder and ultimately received the death penalty. Following this verdict, Gary was then extradited to North Carolina, who'd also determined him to be the likely murderer of John and Irene Bryant in June 2011. He followed suit there in pleading guilty to the five charges of kidnapping, robbery, and murder of the elderly couple. Then he received another sentence of life in prison. However, something unexpected was about to take place. A Florida death penalty case ended up proceeding to the U.S. Supreme Court in 2016, where Judge Sotomayor delivered the opinion of the court. Quote, We hold this sentencing scheme unconstitutional. The Sixth Amendment requires a jury, not a judge, to find each fact necessary to impose a sentence of death. A jury's mere recommendation is not enough, unquote. Sotomayor wrote. Suddenly, all executions in Florida were placed on indefinite hold. After years of court disputes over the issue, executions have since resumed, and Gary Hilton sits on Florida's death row. Multiple appeals at this point have all been denied. During and after his trials, 
Hilton was interviewed by numerous criminal profilers from the FBI and other agencies across the country. According to criminologist Eric Hickey, profilers are generally in consensus that it's highly unlikely that Gary Hilton waited until the age of 61 to begin killing. Hilton also remains a suspect in several other murders throughout the southern United States, some of which authorities seem certain that he's the culprit, and other murders are even contributed to him, but lacking the physical evidence necessary for prosecution. In honor of those murder victims, whether Hilton is the perpetrator or not, I'd like to read the names of everyone that Gary Hilton may have had a hand in. Melissa Witt, Judy Smith, Levi Frady, Jason Knapp, Patrice Andres, Rosanna Miliani, Michael Scott Lewis, Kale Bywater. In addition to these victims, there are numerous missing people from the area that Gary Hilton was known to hunt. The murders of Gary Michael Hilton, the National Forest serial killer, are a grim reminder that slightly more thorough police work could have saved lives, and that, as always, man is the most frightening monster there is. Well, y'all, that's the case of the National Forest serial killer. Now let's talk about it. As a female hiker in the South, Meredith Emerson's story is one that we have all heard and is the reason that most women won't go hiking alone. And she's also the reason that the ones of us who will take weapons with us. He later admit that he specifically targeted her just because she's a woman. Because, of course, you know, that makes her easier to overpower. It does delight me that he wasn't anticipating that she would, you know, kind of kick his ass in the process, but still. As a local, it's not uncommon to meet people who have seen or encountered Gary Hilton. Because he was a drifter who frequented different state parks, national parks, hiking trails around here, a lot of people do have a Gary Hilton story. And often they involve him being really irritable or angry about some small detail. For instance, when I was researching the Meredith Emerson case, often people who encountered Gary said that He was grumbling about how no one was prepared for Blood Mountain. He was the only one prepared for Blood Mountain. Everyone else was an idiot. He apparently saw a search and rescue from there where someone broke their leg and it took them four hours for search and rescue to get them off the mountain. So he made that a personal talking point with a lot of people he encountered. I remember the story as it was happening with the police showing the mugshot on TV and it seemed like Finding the stuff in the dumpster at the quick trip happened pretty much as they arrested him. It seemed like it happened in really quick succession. Everyone was terribly worried about if they were going to find her, and hope was dwindling pretty quickly after they found those things. One thing that I found really fascinating is that, you know, clearly he's a psychopath, and clearly he is as cold hearted as they come. But he would also say things like, my intent was not torture. Or after he attacked Meredith on the mountain and gave her black eyes and a bloody nose, they get in the van and he offered her some aspirin for her headache. And he was also concerned about how she got a small cut on her hand. And she got the small cut on her hand from defending herself from his knife. When he was talking to investigators, He expressed concern that they would have a hard time listening to his story and that it's hard for most people and he was concerned about their mental state. He would make comments um, asking if they had eaten so they wouldn't get low blood sugar, things like that. I know it's probably just the BS of a sociopath trying to fit in and trying to look like they have empathy, but it's sickening and fascinating the way that that works. Along those lines, his quote about how they had spent several good days together while she was abducted is absolutely enraging. That he actually did see that time as spending some good days together. I also find it really hard to believe he waited until his 60s. If he has this level of cold-heartedness and could 
plot and stalk and do this so easily? Do we really think he saw the Bryants and was just like, oh, hey, let me try something new today? I can't imagine how many victims he actually has that no one knows about. I'm going to post some photos of him on the Obscure Appalachia Instagram for y'all to look at. Because if anyone looks evil, it's this guy. You see him and your gut says, oh my God, he's, he's really bad news. It's maddening that there were so many red flags missed on this one. Like It's not one of those stories you hear about really incompetent police work, you know? It's more just that they didn't check that federal database, and I know it wasn't a requirement. But look what could have happened if they had just been the slightest bit more thorough. Another massive red flag is that his former criminal defense attorney considered him dark enough to consult on a movie about stalking and murder, but no one was that concerned about this guy. I mean, he even chose a cabin near his hunting grounds. Cleveland is really close to Blood Mountain. His former boss knew he was really shady. The guy would call to extort money from him, and he kind of waited around on throwing him out, and then waited an hour to call the police, knowing that the guy was a murder suspect. You know, obviously, not every red flag in a person could be followed up on. It's not a crime to be creepy. But this just still could have been so different. As always, I want to know what you think. My original concept for the podcast was to do primarily paranormal, which I've been doing, but with the occasional true crime element. So I really would like to know how you feel about this episode. Do you like having the occasional true crime or should I do exclusively paranormal here? Let me know. You can find me on social media at Obscure Appalachia. Please feel free to send me your personal paranormal experiences at ObscureAppalachia at gmail.com. If you're enjoying the pod, please leave a review on your podcast app to help others find me. Until next time.